Destiny Generation. You gotta go out. Know your faith. You gotta know it to share it. You have to let everyone know. Let me tell you about it. Share the faith. Don't you know that my faith is important to me? It's our destiny. We are the Destiny Generation. We gotta move on to the resurrection, which is even more exciting to me than fulfilled prophecy, is that Jesus comes to us from heaven, walks as one of us, reheads humanity, does what we couldn't, and as the fourth, firstborn from among the dead, walks out of his own tomb and ascends back to where he came from. Whoa! Is that sometimes because of familiarity, we, we forget the potency of this. Jesus came back from the dead. Glorified, resurrected, his injuries now badges of honor, of his love, of what he went through for you. How precious you are to him. That, that he, would, he would stop at nothing to get you back. You mean this to me. And, and he walks out of his own tomb and ascends into the sky. Paul talks about the ascent. He says, you know what? If you don't take my word for it, that I'm an eyewitness to the resurrected Jesus, if you don't take my word for it, you don't have to because 500 people plus watched him ascend into heaven right before their eyes. These eyewitnesses, many of them are still living. You can go ask them yourselves. They'll tell you what they saw. He could never have written something like that if he didn't know it was the case. Referring people to 500 eyewitnesses saying, you don't have to believe me, go talk to them. They'll tell you what they saw. He couldn't have written that if he didn't know it was true. Think about who are the first eyewitnesses of the resurrection, all women, right? All women are the first pe people to witness the empty tomb. Women are honored at the incarnation of Jesus and women are honored at the empty tomb of Jesus as, as the initial witnesses. In a time period when a woman's testimony was not accepted as valid in a court of law. Why is this significant? Because if the writers of the New Testament were trying to concoct a fable, if they were trying to invent a hoax, if they were trying to tell a lie that they knew never took place, if they were trying to invent a religion that they invented in their heads that they knew never happened, you've got to explain to me why in the world they would have used what their culture deemed to be invalid testimony to do so. The only explanation for the way the New Testament is put together is that it's true. Revolutionary statements about all people being equal in worth to God, all people being equally loved by God. Revolutionary statements made 2,000 years ago in a time period that didn't accept a woman's testimony in court. If, they were, if it was a hoax, it never would have been written this way. And if somebody wants to deny the resurrection, they've got to explain to me why in the world the, the inventors of this fable would use what their culture deemed to be invalid testimonies to spread their new religion. The only reason to write it this way is that's how it happened, and that's the truth. Paul couldn't have said, go ask any of these 500 people if it wasn't real. Think about this. James goes up to Peter. Hey, Pete. Yeah, Jimmy. Our Lord's dead. This makes us look bad. Yeah, I know. But I got this idea, right? Go on. Pete, let's invent this fable. So you came back from the dead, dead right? <laughs> it's good. And, and then we could get thrown in prison for it, right? We, we get to eat prison food, you know? And we're not talking conjugal visit prison. We're talking 2,000 years ago in the Middle East prison, prison where, you know, you have to eat the grubs if you're lucky for protein. Chained to walls, chased by authorities. We'll get our heads chopped off. We'll get pelted with stones to death. We'll hang on crosses ourselves. Doesn't that sound great? Yeah! <laughs> Rock on, man, let's do it, all right. And they all go off and invent Christianity and all go to prison and, and are martyred. I, Paul was beheaded. But Peter hung on a cross, upside down because he didn't feel worthy to die the same way his Lord did. James was stoned to death. Stephen was stoned to death. Thaddeus was flayed alive. I, these people were put on tiki torches at Nero's garden parties for what they knew they 
saw with their own two eyes, eyewitnesses of his majesty, not fables as they put it themselves and went to the grave for it. Seriously, what did these people see to make them willing to go through this? If you want to deny the resurrection of Jesus, you've got to explain to me why this band of cowardly fishermen and arrogant Pharisees and tax collectors and prostitutes all suddenly turned into courageous martyrs for something they knew never happened. I don't know about you, but when I lie, it's either to avoid something bad or get something good. They lost livelihoods in exchange to get chased down and imprisoned and killed. People don't do that for something they know didn't, wasn't real, they didn't see. What did these people see to make them willing to go through this? That they saw Jesus, that they met the Son of God, and that they saw a love that changed their lives forever. Now that makes sense. That makes sense. The resurrection happened. This is real. And, and the empty tomb is a historical fact. And non-believers can't get around it. One scholar, in order to explain the empty tomb, made up this theory. Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He, this is published. Because this is the, the empty tomb's a problem. If there wasn't an empty tomb, there's no Christianity. Hey, have you ever heard of the cult of Hadris? Probably not. Because belief systems based around a guy conquering death don't stick around if the guy stays dead. <laughs> heard of the Waco movement, David Koresh? Maybe. But it's gone. Why? Because David Koresh stayed dead. Belief systems based around coming back from the dead die out if the person stays dead. <laughs> and there's still Christianity. Because the tomb was empty, that's a fact. So how do these, how do these non-Christians explain it? Like this guy. Okay, Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He merely fainted or swooned. <laughs> they thought he was dead. Okay, put him in the tomb, and then, and then when he, like, revived, they thought it was a resurrection, and that's what accounts for it. That's, that was his explanation. Let's take a look at this. Okay, let, let's take an objective look. Like, let's, if he wants to be a scholar, let's be scholarly about this. And take a scientifically minded, objective look at this theory. Jesus is scourged. He's losing blood. He's infected. He's got holes in his, in, in his hands and feet. His side is pierced. Blood and water come out, which means he's dead. <laughs> and then he's wrapped in burial garments. He's put in a tomb, which is guarded by a two-ton rock that according to the Bazai manuscripts, 20 men can't move that thing once it's in its place once it's rolled into its groove. And it's sealed there with a cord and sealing clay and guarded by the finest military force in the world at the time, the Roman guard, the fighting force of the Roman Empire, who were doubly armed with both a sword and a Roman pike, a six-foot shaft with a spear on the end of it, and wore enough armor to double their size, and always worked in groups of at least four men on duty at all times, a four to 16-man security force, so that there's always four out of these giants of the Roman militia are guarding this scene. And you're telling me that after three days of infection, three days of blood loss, three days of dehydration, suddenly, like dark sparkling Folgers crystals, the cool fresh air of the tomb revives Jesus. He rips off the burial clothes. He rolls away a 2,000 pound rock. He beats up the Roman guards and he walks into town looking like this and says, I'm back from the dead. And they believe it. And then when he really dies someday, there's no record of it. Come on. This goes to show, this goes to show the extent people will go through to explain this away. One atheist was challenged with how absurd atheism is from a scientific point of view. Honestly, it's absurd and blind faith. And his answer, and I've got to respect his honesty, was this. I have a promiscuous lifestyle. 
And if God is real, I have to answer for it. I have a vested interest in writing God out of the world. At least he was honest, and that God can work with. That God can work with. But man, the resurrection is real. Somebody denies the resurrection. Somebody denies Christianity. Somebody denies the gospel. They got to explain to me why in the world an invisible, telepathically speaking presence left at that name. They've got to explain to me the countless answered prayers and miraculous things I've witnessed since I entered the church. And there's no way they can do that. And they've got to explain to me washed white as snow. They've got to explain to me the, the, the sensation that indescribably comes over me after confession and what that's all about. The need for redemption, the need for a redeemer, and then the reality of having it. They've got to explain to me how chance, random accident, and mutation accounts for beauty, goodness, truth, humor, fine arts, morality, falling in love, bonding. And they can't. Is a crucified Christ the kind of God interested in a popularity contest? You can't tell me God is not the author of human history. Belief by itself is not enough. Intellectual assent to the truth is by itself not enough. In fact, by itself, all that does is create accountability. It's not just about being aware that it's the case. As the Bible says very clearly, the demons believe and tremble. Because for them, it means they know their time is short and they know where they're headed. So no, being aware that this is the case is, is not enough. Christianity is not just about orthodoxy. It's not just about right belief. It's also about orthopraxis, right practice. Christianity is lived. God revealed his name as Yahweh, which is a verb. We think of names as, as nouns. You know, what are, what, what are nouns? places, things, and persons. So we think of persons as nouns. God revealed his name as a verb, I am. God is love and love is action, love is doing. This is lived. It's not only known to be true, but it's relationship. It's a lived out growth in a covenant. It's like a marriage and it has to go there. If you turn to Job chapter 40, you'll read a very interesting exchange. The Lord said to Job, will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. Then Job answered the Lord, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. This is an ancient way of saying talk to the hand to God. Now Job's been through a lot and he's been complaining, he has been lamenting. There are whole psalms that are nothing but lament. And that's, complaining isn't always bad because complaining, well you complain to someone who you believe can help and is listening to you. Often complaint is a sign of faith if it doesn't get too far. God didn't take issue with Job's complaining, but when Job said talk to the hand, when Job said, I'm cutting you off, I'm not speaking to you anymore, when he broke off covenant, when he stopped the relationship, then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. All of a sudden there's a storm. God is the God of covenant. God is wild. You ever hear somebody say, oh, I am so in love, I am so in love with my bow, or I am so in love with my pumpkin cake, and we never fight. Either they're lying, or they're not in love. Love is gritty. It gets deep, it gets dark, it gets honest, it gets vulnerable. You're going to clash. God's ways and thoughts are higher than our own, and he wants best friendship with us. He's going to be perplexing at times, and you're going to take issue with it. But what does he do? He says, cast all your cares on me because I care for you. What does he say? He, he says, keep knocking. What does he say? He says, I, I, I want relationship. I want, I want covenant. I want all of you. I'm a jealous God. He has the hairs on your head numbered. 
You know, we're so obsessed with fame in this culture. You know, we act like Justin Bieber can save our souls. You know, we act like Jesus can't. You, know, you ever see one of these one of these concerts? I don't, I don't mean like enjoying and getting into the fun of a rock and roll. I mean outright idolatry. Have you ever seen it? It looks like a liturgy. You got people's arms raised. You got people shouting someone's name. You've got people lighting candles, waving their arms. You've got people staring at somebody in adoration. It looks like church. For many people, it is. And I think what's really happening in those scenes is people look to their idols is, is what they're really screaming when they're crying out that person's name is, is, will you please notice me? Please, look my way. Make me feel special. You're, you're special. Make me feel special. Just look my way once and I'll feel so special. And all the while, they're looking to this idol saying, please notice me, look my way. God Almighty is looking at them saying, please notice me. I died for you. They didn't. God is not impressed by dazzling pronouncements of self. His kingdom is not about how puffy you can get. It, it, it is a crucified Christ. <laughs> is a crucified Christ the kind of God interested in a popularity contest? He has the hairs on your head numbered. You are that precious to him. It has nothing to do with how noticed you are. That's, that's this world's measures. It's not about numbers. It's not about impact. And we're exhausting ourselves projecting images, how we want to be seen by others. Project the image. Project the image. Don't be vulnerable. Don't be honest. Keep it under control. Project the image. This is how I want to be seen. I've got to project that image. I want to be seen this way. And it's exhausting because we want to be received, we want to be loved, we already are. And God, God wants you, your heart. That's what this is about. And that's the connection that's not being made. You know, I, I had to go visit a professor once, big famous archeologist, Dr. Von Weirich. He was uh, like a modern day Indiana Jones. He was invited to examine the ossuary of James's bones when they discovered it in the Middle East and confirmed that it was authentic. I mean, this is the level of this guy in the archeological field. And I have this big meeting with this big scholar and he's famous and, and it's my time for my meeting. I knock on his door, he comes out, he says, hey man, I'm sorry, I have to reschedule because my boy showed up, I'm having lunch with my kid. And I saw him in there dancing, playing, having a good time, eating ramen noodles with his little boy. I, I wouldn't have that any other way. And then I had this image hit me of Gabriel and Michael going up to God saying, man, we got to have a war council here. Some things are going down on the earth. We got to meet it. And God's saying, okay, that's great. And we will, but not right now. I'm having lunch with my girl. I'm having lunch with my daughter. Whatever it is can wait. He's daddy. He's the daddy who waits on the porch for the one step his direction to jump off it. When I ignore him, he misses me. When somebody hurts my feelings, he's hurt on my behalf. Christianity is lived. I had the privilege of addressing a peace rally in Northern Ireland for Catholic Protestant reconciliation, which is a very serious issue over there. They're spilling blood over it. And, and I gave this reflection and it kind of stuck with me. The greater thing. I love God and he's my friend, but there's a greater thing. He loves me. When I ignore him, he misses me. When somebody hurts my feelings, he's hurt on my behalf. When I don't talk to him all week, he feels neglected. And when I'm excited to see him, he's excited to see me and he just wants to spend time with me. Not only is he my friend and brother, but I'm his. And that's the greater thing. You're his friend and brother. Every hair on your head counted, whoever you are. He doesn't care about numbers. He doesn't care about popularity. He doesn't care about this world's measures for worth. Your dignity comes from him and his love for you, what he went through for you, and what he can do with a yes. Mary shows us what he did with the yes of, of a junior high-aged girl. Do you know what he can do with one yes? 
as you watch his kingdom, which comes forth within people's hearts, because he sees the heart, he wants the heart. He doesn't care about the projected image. He wants the heart. That's where he's probing. He searches the deep things. He wants intimacy with you. Have you ever prayed to God? Have you ever been so real with him that you've prayed to him while you're sinning? I couldn't do that, how irreverent. In the middle of a, oh, that's, that's just the thought of it. That's so good. Look, he already knows you're doing it. <laughs> He's God. What, what would happen if you went to him and said, all right, Lord, let's talk about this. There's, I'm, I'm experiencing this need I'm perceiving in my life. I don't feel like you're needing it, so I'm willfully stepping outside of your will for my life to take care of this myself. That's what I'm doing right now. He can deal with hot and he can deal with cold. He can deal with people who are on fire for him. He can deal with people who are ice cold toward him. But what our wild God of marriage covenant cannot stomach is lukewarm. He won't deal with fake. You want to talk about raw, raw relationship, like, you know, Abraham arguing with God, Job arguing with God, the one we looked at, David arguing with God, Jonah, the apostles. In the New Testament, how about, how about Hosea? Here's Hosea in a nutshell. I need a prophet. Here am I, Hosea, I will go, Lord. Great. You see that, that prostitute over there? Her name's Gomer. <laughs> yeah, man, you believe what she's doing? Yeah, uh, I want you to marry her. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, okay, yes, sir. Okay. I got uh, flowers. I got a ring here. I get, all right, Gomer. Like, whatever. Okay. Uh, you have to leave your life of prostitution. Will you be my wife? Marry me. Okay. Oh, all right, all right. I can, you can't, but no, you can't. Oh, you can't keep, no, she's doing it again. She can't, she's still practicing prostitution, Lord. Yes, Hosea? Look what she's doing. He's still a prostitute. Well, well, yeah, it's, she is a prostitute, Hosea. <laughs> I, what do I do? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to forgive her and take her back. Yeah. Ways and thoughts are higher. I don't get you sometimes. I just can't get to. Okay, Gomer, uh, you got to stop this, but you know what? I forgive you, and I want to make it work. I take you back. Here's some chocolate. <laughs> Sinfully delicious. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Okay. All right. What? No, no, I don't believe this. Lord, you tell me to marry a prostitute, and so she goes and cheats on me. And then you tell me forgive her and take her back, and so I do, and then she cheats on me again. Now you know how I feel. <laughs> Jose, in a nutshell. This is a very personal and intimate God. This is a God of covenant. This is a God who wants, who's jealous. He's a jealous God. Have you ever felt jealous? He feels that way for you. And he takes idolatry as adultery. And that's, what's, that's what gets lost is so many times when people have the right theology, it stays in their head and it loses that heart connection and they don't have friendship. They don't, they don't, the whole point was this marriage, was this res restoration of paradise. Walk, taking walks with God in the cool of the evening and enjoying one another's company as best friends. Not just knowing truth about stuff, but a, a growing, living, alive, in love relationship that's real, that's real with yourself and real with your Lord, whatever it is. Hot or cold, real with him, authentic. Something I call the slippery slope. Here's the slippery slope. It starts out, you're happy because you appreciate. You're happy because you still appreciate. Well, if you're appreciative, you're happy. In other words, appreciative, filled with thanksgiving, filled with gratitude, grateful. You appreciate. If you're in a state of appreciating stuff, you're a happy person. And then comes down the slippery slope. It starts like this. You start to take for granted. 
and immediately your happiness level drops, your joy goes down. Then after taking for granted, it goes to you start to expect things. Your joy drops more. And then after expecting things, you start to demand things, and your joy is gone. And so I, I want to address the greatest apologetic of them all. I call it the fifth gospel. And that's the good news. We have the good news according to Mark, Matthew, Luke, John, right? What's the good news according to you? This is your story. You're a character in this story. You've re-encountered it, not reenacted it. He wants that kind of wild, passionate covenant and best friendship and walks in the cool of the evening and realness with each other that any two people truly in love will have is that kind of authenticity and rawness, even if it means arguing where you never say, I'm cutting you off, but you say, okay, this is what's going on and get it out on the table, get some light on it. He wants that kind of real with you. What's the gospel according to you? That, there's your evidence. That is where God will come so alive that you don't need any of the textbook proofs because you've met him. You can't deny knowing someone who you've met. There's your greatest evidence. Praise Jesus. Thank you all very much. Sometimes because of familiarity, we, we forget the potency of this. Jesus came back from the dead. How precious you are to him. <laughs>